That is one big pile of shit. Looking back on 2022, it's clear that it was a watershed year in terms of entertainment and storytelling. Disney stock dropped by 44% for the first time in 40 years. Hollywood had the worst box office showing in decades. Shows were axed left and right. But not only that, fewer and fewer people are now buying books. More people are leaving schools borderline illiterate and around the globe, mediocrity in storytelling has become the norm. Our ability to share and connect has never been stronger, but our stories are are becoming weaker and weaker. And at the center of this is the war on modern myth. It's high time that we have a very serious discussion about what is going on and find out what all of us can do about this. Hi there everyone, Lars here from Camille's Harem. Not just a podcast for novice writers by novice writers, but also a YouTube channel by novice writers for novice writers. Because writing is an adventure, it's more fun with friends. And up front, if you're interested in the power that stories have, then I highly recommend checking out my newest book, Tumble Teller. Read from the perspective of a bardic dragon the joy, the liberation, and the meaning of telling and sharing stories. It's one of the coolest rides you can go on and is far more entertaining than 90% of the drivel that's been released by Hollywood and television right now. So give Tumble Teller a read and help support us here at Camille's Harem. And in regards to this video, I ask that you please stick around until the very end or use the timestamps to jump around to the topics that you find most interesting. This is stuff that we really need to talk about, and I understand that it's a lot. So I am asking for quite a bit of commitment of time. Again, use the timestamps if you feel like jumping around. Or you can just have me blabbering on in the background for background noise, white noise, or for your entertainment. But the thing is this, is that I feel like it's really important that I make this video because the war a modern myth is real and it's ongoing and we're just getting into the thick of this conflict and it is something that we all have a part to play in. The War on Modern Myth is a topic that I have been monitoring for years now, and given all the claims and arguments flying about from all different kinds of YouTubers and social commentators, I think it's high time that this novice author throws his own hat into the ring. However, unlike many of the others covering the War on Modern Myth, I feel like I'm uniquely qualified to speak on this matter. I'm not just a creator and storyteller, but I'm also a trained historian. And I'm a historian who cut his teeth on documenting and analyzing myths and their impacts on society. Furthermore, I have actually spent time in the room with the people who are in part responsible for the war on our modern myths. However, saying that, this video is not meant to be a tell-all that rips away the cloak of deceit and deception worn by those who control establishment publishing and movie and television studios. No, instead, this video is meant to address the prevalent narratives and give a different view on what is happening, and also to give a message of hope to everyone who watches this. Because your voice matters. Yes, you have power. For all my fellow storytellers out there, believe me when I say that the world needs your stories. Your stories need you, and, your st and you need your stories. Write and share your amazing ideas because they will be what changes the world in this decade, in the 2020s. And to all you fans of fantasy, sci-fi, drama, mystery, romance, or whatever, you have amazing power as well. What you choose to give your time and money to will determine the entertainment and storytelling of the future. Your word of mouth is more powerful than any advertising campaign, and way cheaper too. And the way you show your love for stories, from everything from coffee mugs to quoting your favorite movie, to talking about books at the water cooler at your work, or to dress up in cosplay, go to cosplay. Comic Con and all these other things and more brings yet more people into the nerdy fold and props up the stories that you love. Change for the better is possible and I see it happening. But the war on modern myth is far from over. In fact, it has only just begun. Things will get worse and messier before they get better. And unless we small people band together, we might lose the chance of a lifetime to seize this decade and bring a positive, creative, and earth-moving shift that will empower earnest storytellers and creatives and reward fans and lovers of great stories for years to come. 
To illustrate all of this, I will break down this video into the following parts. Part number one, explaining what myth is. Number two, explain what constitutes modern myth. Three, break down the history of the war on our modern myths. Four, evaluating and analyzing the state of our current storytelling. And five, address the solutions to this conflict. History became legend. Legend became myth. And some things that should not have been forgotten were lost. What are myths? Most children can easily answer this question. Myths are fantastic tales that are either based on a truth or have truths somewhere wrapped up in them. And that's very straightforward. However, mythology is anything but simple and straightforward. Myths are alive, they are malleable, they are integral to our identity and our understanding of this world and our place in it. A professor of mine once explained that myths exist to explain why something is. So if you have, any, if you have a question, for example, like, hey, why is there this horrifying volcano? Oh, well, let me tell you about this titan called Vesuvius, who was created by the Earth to kill the gods of Mount Olympus. Well, why is there a labyrinth of ruins on a faraway island full of bulls? Oh, well, let me tell you about this dreaded minotaur. Well, why does the sun rise and fall in the sky? Oh, well, let me tell you about the god Ra and his ship carrying the sun and the great battles he wages for all of us. Why are we building a gigantic wall that can be seen from space? Well, let me tell you about these demons that walk in straight lines. And why is there this massive temple in the center of our city? Well, son, let me tell you about Quetzalcoatl. And finally, why are there grinning penis statues everywhere I walk? The short answer is Hermes. Everything from man-made structures to natural phenomena to history to the human condition were all explained through myths. It doesn't really matter what the story is so long as it can answer the question that the asker has. Now, that's the easy stuff that they teach you in school, but where myths get interesting is how they change and evolve. And the added fact that people have been bickering and arguing about these stories from the beginning. Myth wars are nothing new. One of the best examples to illustrate this are the stories of Hercules, or Heracles, as the most educated personnel insist on calling him. But as we see, Disney had way different plans for this guy's name. Hercules! Hercules, Hercules the myth. I'm an action figure! Hercules is just one of Zeus's many bastard children. However, his incredible strength and his deeds in the service of others were so captivating to the ancient Greek world that everyone wanted a piece of it. City-states everywhere wanted to claim that Hercules did this or that for their people and thereby helped make their city so amazing and long-lastingly awesome. This means that you have all these tales of Hercules that actually don't match up. And bards and historians have tried for years to bring all these tales together into one cohesive story, when that might not have been the case for the ancient Greeks. Everyone had their own story of Hercules that they claimed in order to claim him for their personal myth. There you have it, myth wars, with all of the culture, politics, and rivalries that came with them. But where the story of Hercules gets very interesting in my opinion, and somewhat funny, is in Bactra, where the world of the Greeks through the Macedonian conquest of Alexander the Great ran up against India. This crossroad between cultures produced some truly exquisite art and stories. As the Buddha's teachings and the lifestyles and religions and myths surrounding his word spread, it inevitably brushed up against the Greco-Persian peoples of Bactra, and they loved the Buddha. So they incorporated Buddha into their pantheon of deities, and you literally have stories of Hercules hanging out with a buff Buddha. And it gets even better, because the original images of a skinnier, more ascetic Buddha not only go through the CrossFit transformation of Bactra, getting all those gains, but when Buddha was communicated then to the Chinese along the Silk Road, they interpreted such an enlightened man as one of, as one of their own scholars and wise men, which was be fat, a person fat because they sit around philosophizing all the time. So Buddha goes from skinny to buff to fat, all while hanging out with Hercules, fighting Persian monsters and bringing Nirvana to beleaguered villagers. 
That is the transformative nature of myth. Everyone had a chance to add or take away from it, adding real or fake histories, examining different aspects of the human condition, incorporating their own cultures and beliefs, and thus the story of a guy who banged 50 women to prove his demigod status became an enlightened warrior fighting alongside the Buddha. Ah, uh, aren't myths great? So, to wrap up this part of our video, myths are based on observable truths. From people, to history, to nature, to civilizations, they are fantastic explanations for things we want to know, and they help to contextualize our own identity and our place within this world. Myths do change over time, and as people interact with them, they grow and become something new, and whether they be the original story or something different far down the road, they all have value as entertainment and as tales that answer our questions. If you are interested in learning more, please, please check out the channel Overly Sarcastic Productions and Kings and Generals video on Bactra. Links for those will be in the video description, and I'm also leaving a video link here for one of my favorite OSP breakdowns of myth, Hades and Persephone. That video will incorporate everything that I've talked about here thus far and go even deeper than I can do in this video. Now, let's explore the concept of the modern myth. There are two big differences between the myths of the present and the myths of antiquity, or really anything pre-20th century. Modern myths function in the exact same way as historical myths, with the first big exception being that we no longer actively tell tales that help to explain nature, history, or weird phenomena. We now have science, record-keeping, and all kinds of empirical evidence to prove what is happening in our world. And as a result, a lot of stories have fallen by the wayside. For example, just think that we've lost an entire tradition of telling scary ghost stories during Christmas. Historians are scrambling to save what precious little we still have from that era. And faith in deity is largely waning across many societies. And now that we have better records and analyses, we can pick apart legends, both past and living. Just look at how the American scholarship regarding the uh, Civil War mythos has entirely changed things. We are destroying the South's many legends, which culminates in the Lost Cause mythology, which... As a little personal aside, that's absolutely fair. That should be done because the lost cause is stupid. But it goes to show that something that stood for 100 years is now being torn apart. It only took them 20 years to utterly destroy a mythology that influenced American identity for about 100 years. But coming back to modern myth, it is now stories that capture us. These are the stories that tell us of the modern human condition. They speak of love, loss, heroism, villainy, finding your place, finding your identity, and more. Because in a world where we think we understand everything around us, we continue to struggle with understanding ourselves. When you hear people talk about modern myth, they talk about heroic figures that they can look up to, messages of family, messages of selflessness, messages of community, and so forth. And to illustrate these concepts, those same stories now also explore darkness, the destruction wrought by selfishness, what it means to be alone, and so on. There are so many stories that explore these, and some notables are The Lord of the Rings, which completely recreated the fantasy genre, Star Trek, Star Wars, The Chronicles of Perdane, Conan the Barbarian, Dune, Superman and Batman, Captain America and the X-Men, Dirty Harry, Seven Samurai and the Magnificent Seven, Godzilla, Dracula, Frankenstein, and basically anything to do with werewolves, zombies, and vampires, E.T., Schindler's List, and it goes on on for miles. There are so many different examples that we can look to. There are so many modern myths that have profound impacts on us and have taught us valuable life lessons that have captured the human condition of a particular era and they have entertained us. Many, many stories have been forgotten because they were not entertaining or valuable enough to be passed down from one generation to the next. Now, for the second big difference between older myths and modern ones, because we have such excellent record keeping now, we have preserved the originals. True, they can be lost to time over the course of 
hundreds or thousands of years, but right now we have the original myths of our day and we can spread them across the entire world without the previous process of filtering and transforming these stories as they slowly move between nations and cultures. This means that an exact canon or base of understanding of a story that everyone has to build on is for the most part there and available and largely agreed upon. This will be important for understanding the ferocity of the, of the war on modern myth and the strategies employed by various factions in this conflict. What these accurate recordings of the original myths mean is that our ability to communicate them even faster than before is overriding, again, the transformative process that all ancient myths have where they went from place to place to place and people added and took away. Again, think about what happened with the stories of Hercules and how they evolved. However, that doesn't mean that modern myths today don't evolve in their own way. They do. However, they evolve more in the sense of how they inspire people to create new stories that go on to entertain and communicate important values to a new generation and future generations. And I think a good way of illustrating this is to show one of the roads that led to the creation of My Hero Academia and the worldwide success that it has been. And that that road starts with World War II. This is actually something that I extensively researched as both an undergraduate and graduate student. And some of the things I discovered got my career in academia torpedoed. So while this video isn't a tell-all about what happens beyond, behind the uh, curtain of the evil wizard, here's a cool story about those who wage war on modern myth and what they don't want you to hear. Before World War II, the United States championed two ideal hero archetypes, the Paragon American and the Little Guy. But here's the thing, the Little Guy was more of a folk hero. Books, movies, and most plays referred to the Paragon, the big guy, the outstanding hero that no regular person could ever hope to be like. It was America's frontier history and constant influx of immigrants, however, that kept the idea of the Little Guy, the Little Hero, alive. But those who controlled the mainstream storytelling preferred the Paragon. This all changed after the attack on Pearl Harbor. This was because the U.S. needed massive amounts of troops and volunteers to grow the country's military industry. But how are you going to grab all those little people? How are you going to grab up the citizens of this nation to fight in a very scary war? Well, the answer is simple. We're going to transform America's staple hero from the Paragon to the small guy. Again, we see how myths are malleable, and the marked fact that Hollywood led this change is important. Movies were cranked out by the dozens as not only propaganda, but as a means of reshaping American thinking. This was supported through other means of storytelling, like comics. One of the most prominent being the story of Captain America. Steve Rogers, who goes from scrawny all-American nobody to a great hero and in inspiration, upholding traditional and wartime values use of America. The rebranding campaign for American identity was so strong that it has even weathered the blows of the Vietnam, Afghan, and Iraqi wars. And that's because these stories, these modern myths, communicate to Americans a noble identity and valiant values of selflessness, love, duty, honor, fighting evil, all of which are actually universal values. Not just America, but the whole world took hold of these stories because of what they communicated, the nobility and grand potential in every human being and that is a powerful message these myths created by the Second World War went on to inspire the next generation of storytellers. Superman became an even greater paragon. We were introduced to the X-Men, outsiders who looked to fight bigotry, misunderstanding, and evil by embracing their noble identities, which include embracing their powers and inherent differences. And finally, we get characters like Spider-Man, who is the new generation's version of the little guy becoming a great hero. And remember, these values are universal. They were readily accepted in Japan, a nation that had been an enemy to the West. These myths then inspired Kohei Horikoshi, who then made My Hero Academia. And if you read through My Hero, you find the stories of Captain America and Superman rolled up in All Might, and Deku is clearly a New Age Spider-Man. Spend some time talking with comic book fans and you'll find that so many of them love All Might, 
Why? Because he is the pillar of hope. His goodness is that of Superman, and his journey is that of Steve Rogers. He is a true inspiration that passes along the amazing messages that's not just for Deku, but for every single one of us who reads or watches this story. You told me you didn't have a power, so when I saw this timid, quirkless boy try to save a life, it inspired me to act too. There are stories about every hero. Most have one thing in common. Their bodies moved before they had a chance to think. <laughs> Young man, you too can become a hero. I really hope that this little tangent puts you on your own path of research and that you'll discover that everything I'm saying about modern myth is true. How we've changed, how myths still evolve, how they focus on who we are and who we can become, and how they are preserved in a way that codifies them for multiple generations. All of that is there for you to discover and I think you'll even find some amazing things on your own when you look at how modern myths have been preserved and how they have inspired current myths that are just now forming. Well, you might now be thinking, okay, well, that's actually really cool, Lars. That's a great challenge. I'll definitely take you up on that. Thank you for that interesting little bit of history leading up to My Hero Academia. I'll give that a shot now and see, see if that improves or expands my enjoyment of the series. That's all really cool. But how on earth did this lead to your academic career being torpedoed? What is the dark story right here? Well, again, this isn't exactly a tell-all, but to put it very succinctly, effectively what I was discovering was destroying a narrative that was supposed to be prevalent. A narrative that's supposed to go out and dominate not just the world of academics, but really how people are supposed to perceive their modern myths. Now, I must reiterate at this point, here on Camille's Harem, the only politics we care about are fictional politics. I don't care who or what you vote for or what you believe in. You have that right to do whatever you want. You do you. I'd rather discuss the dangerous politics of the Alethi court. But for this part of our analysis, I much I must touch on some uncomfortable history. Why? Because it is politically charged. And of course, that then leads to the question, Lars, why are you bending this ironclad rule for Camille's harem that we don't talk about modern day politics? Why? Well, because in order to understand the current war on modern myth, we have to know why and how this is happening. And while you can trace the conflict over myth back to ancient Greece and Egypt, for us in the 21st century, it begins in the 1950s. Immediately after World War II, the Cold War kicked off. It kicked into high gear. Part of the Iron Curtain falling entailed that the Soviet Union exiled tons of communist intellectuals who were too Marxist for a total dictator and maniac like Stalin and his sycophants. These exiles scattered, and all throughout the 1950s, they, they wrote books, essays, and plays, practically begging Stalin to take them back. Others wrote about how communism had started and why it needed to be reformed for a brand new age. But there is one thing that they all had in common. They believed that communism would sweep the world and introduce a utopia. However, as the Vietnam War came to its end, the dream shattered. Communism wasn't going to win, and countless millions were dead all across the world in a pointless ideological conflict. And again, this is why we avoid real world politics on this channel. Yeesh, that's some dark stuff. Furthermore, the world was changing into a new form of economic colonialism. The idealists of the neoliberals or neo-Marxists had to come to grips with the reality that Marx's predictions were all wrong. Well, that didn't go over too well. For people who had dedicated themselves to a cause and ideology, accepting that defeat meant accepting that their lives had been one horrifying lie. So they plotted revenge. These intellectuals taught their students, closest young admirers, and followers that they had only failed because the time wasn't right for communism to take over. The world needed to be re-educated. They dictated to their followers that they must prep the world for a cultural revolution first that would precede the glorious Marxist revolution that Marx and Engels had foreseen. So the new generation of neo-Marxists waited and with bated breath, hoping that the 80s and 90s would be the right time to strike. And then Gorbachev obliterated the Soviet Union using actual Marxism. 
go figure, showing that the system just wasn't working. Those professors and acolytes turned and wrote hilariously awful books and essays ordering the third generation of neo-Marxists to lie in wait. When the status quo changed, they need to be ready and lead the cultural revolution. The time for this revolution came in the late 2000s and early 2010s, as various political developments across the world, and especially in America, seemed like the perfect bat signal. A series of hastily written books and essays at this time now claimed that it was time to initiate the cultural revolution. And I have read this hilarious nonsense, and I didn't believe it back when I read these things in grad school because their dreams and visions were contradictory and even refuted by events immediately following their publication. But the declaration of war had been made, and the work of now four generations of neo-Marxists compounded. They needed to reshape not just Western values, but global values. To do that, they needed to deconstruct or obliterate modern myths. And they knew that to do that, they needed to control all of the institutions that promulgate our storytelling. Now, this is where I'm going to slap down a ton of conspiracy theories. There is no cabal of professors controlling everything. No, why? Because they hate each other. These professors would rather shoot each other or stab each other in the back before they let another one of their colleagues take credit for the for any sort of ideological victory. And there is no woke Illuminati hellbent on rewriting all comics. Kathleen Kennedy is a horrible business leader and storyteller, but she is not the storytelling antichrist. And J.J. Abrams might be a hack and a cunning businessman and sadly a horrible storyteller and teacher, but he's not ruling Hollywood like some sinister kingpin. Again, I've read the personal trees and declarations of war from these generations of neo-Marxists, and they just don't agree with each other on fundamental beliefs. In the world of higher academia, like I said, they despise each other. They really do. I've seen them gleefully stick the proverbial knife in their own allies' backs in order to, grain, in order to gain power and popularity and money. It's even more true in places like Hollywood, where they only care about their own power. They don't really care about the cause or the message so much as it is able to increase their own power. The war on myth is nothing like Germany sweeping across Europe in World War II, but it's more akin to the Roman Empire haphazardly gobbling up its neighbors and spending centuries trying to hold it all together. And bear that particular description in mind, because that simile masquerading as a metaphor is going to be critical for later. Now, I covered all of this history to help contextualize all of the politicking, ideology, and messaging going on in modern entertainment. It has a long and storied history, but it is a mess. And those who tried to implement these ideological changes when war was declared to modern myth were not unified, and there was no real process or end goal other than this ideological academic nonsense. This changed, however, and radically so, in 2016 with Kevin Feige's Ghostbusters. Now, the full history of that debacle can be covered by a whole lot of other people. In fact, it already has been, so I will refer you to other sources. I highly recommend Midnight Edge's various retrospectives on the topic. And if you want a swan dive down that particular crazy rabbit hole, I will have a link for you down in the description. But what makes 2016 so important for the shift in the war on modern myth and storytelling is because stories were now actively used to attack rather than to entertain or even educate. The dialogue, the plotting, the messaging of each story, the characters, were all chosen and written to bludgeon audiences with everything necessary to facilitate a global, sh global shift, to basically guilt trip them, to force them, to twist the, to stick the knife in and twist it, to basically make people upset in order to elicit some sort of revolution that would bring about this utopian world order that they foresaw. But did it actually work? Heck no. Attacking and lecturing the audiences didn't work in the long run at all. All of these news stories and unwanted sequels to classics and other strange nonsenses, remakes, retellings, reboots, have not resonated with the worldwide audience at all because, well, they have been raised on a particular set of myths. That meant that all those myths needed now to be written and reshaped. And this is a strategy that works perfectly well in a creatively based 
bankrupt Hollywood, who was already doing tons of needless sequels, prequels, and remakes of classics and of far more successful stories. This has plagued the publishing community as well, which demanded more modern retellings of older stories. For better or for worse, fairy tales have been rewritten again and again and again, and new generations were given to establish epics tearing down their progenitors, and other stories were written to fit a list of checkboxes rather than doing anything inventive or new. And so, entertainment has spiraled downward, downward as mean-spirited advertisement strategies, power-hungry ideologues, and preachy, uninventive storytelling have combined into an unholy perfect storm. From this, you get stuff like the insulting Last Jedi, the enraging Rings of Power, the depressing new Star Trek adventures, the abyssal Terminator sequels and rewritings, the confusing Charlie's Angels, the laughably awful Rise of Palpatine, and all the smaller shows that have driven people to drink. And when I go to the bookstore, I see a number of fancy covers to books that have no buzz because no one's reading them. This veritable waterfall of bad stories have been, per have been just pounding us. For six years, and then because Hollywood and publishers are convinced that they can recreate the monumental cultural shift caused by World War II, they just continue on. And yet they have failed in ushering the glorious global changes that they were charged with enacting. Instead, we have a desolate wasteland of awful stories. And finally, that rant takes me to the current status of storytelling. We live in a time of great paradoxes. It has never been easier to write and produce your own stories. Anyone with a camera these days and just a little ingenuity can begin telling video stories. 15 minutes a day and some planning and you can make amazing headway on writing a book. The industry for storytelling is vast and people crave to be entertained. So there's a lot of potential and possibility for everyone. And yet, and yet, storytelling these days is just so lazy. Many creators take the easy way out, making cheap tales that tickle some weird fetish or fantasy or just hit all the correct political buttons. Boxes. If a story doesn't work, it's become acceptable to blame your audience rather than reflect and improve. It's the worst combination of hubris and sloth. Both the industry and creators are falling short of their potential. The same stories get rehashed and retold again and again and again and again and again until we've grown bored and believe this tripe that there's no such thing as an original story, which is false. We could fill a library with a full analysis of all the reasons why modern storytelling has suffered as a result of the war on modern myth, combined with new storytellers getting lost in the violent mists of misinformation, misdirection, and mediocrity, unsure if they can ever complete and tell their stories. But while we cannot list all of the problems facing modern storytelling today, here are some things that we have that we have seen definitely hurt the industry. A lack of respect for others, especially your audience. A resurgence of the Mary Sue trope and character. The inability to communicate emotions and thought processes in engaging in nuanced ways. Poorly written, rushed, toxic romances. And sadly, this includes a lot of negative portrayals of the LGBTQ community. And then removing villainy from the villains, just making them petty and pathetic. Putting ideology or personal vendettas before telling a good story, retellings of famous stories with only minimal changes and the infinite march of reboots, the lack of intelligent and awesome action sequences, poor character development, and the, nowadays for so many stories there is no such thing as a plot. Things just happen and they're strung together by common characters and people are afraid to be funny. And I don't know what's going on, but people are also no longer editing their first drafts. And lastly, for this condensed list, too many creators are unwilling to take feedback. What makes these many problems all the more tragic is that we have never been more creative in human history. Just take a look at your local bookstore and see all the new stories coming out. Definitely check the kids section. There are so many amazing tales being told, and yet they hardly get any attention. And this is in part because we are no longer encouraging younger generations to get lost in a good book. I found it so hard to reprimand students in my classes who weren't paying attention because they were reading. It was a joy to see them actually reading any kind of book. So to any adults watching this, please encourage the kids and teens in your life to read more, even if it means bribing them with candy or something. But coming back to what I said about people being more creative today than ever before, it is true. Just look at the news stories coming out from lesser known authors, filmmakers, musicians, artists, and so forth. 
It's just that so many of these stories, so many of these works of art are overshadowed by more expensive productions, ideological platforming, and just so much has been lost in the shuffle of an ever-shifting and changing work environment. It can be very, very frustrating to be a storyteller right now. It feels like you may never have your chance and that you'll never be heard. But it is possible to self-publish and self-produce your own projects. But without a big establishment budget, getting your voice heard is just so difficult. And I know from personal experience and yet it is also possible to make your stories and get them out there to the masses more so than ever before even if you don't become famous you can still make your art and find an audience the acts of creating and sharing are so rewarding in and of themselves that I would not let money or fame dissuade you from the process at all like I said, this is a big paradox we are living through, but we here at Camille's Harem have been doing our best for years to bring insights, assistance, and resources to novice writers to help them make the most of their projects so they can share their stories with the rest of the world. And it's something we intend to keep doing, no matter the status of our channel or our own writing careers. And that almost brings me to our final topic, solutions. But before I do that, let me address an aspect of the War on Modern Myth that some commentators here, here on YouTube are only beginning to wake up to. The war is far from over. Indeed, it is only beginning. Think of establishment storytelling from Hollywood to the publishing industry as Rome. Just like the Empire of Rome, they were not built in a day, and they have long survived so many conflicts and disasters. While they have suffered defeats, they regroup, they learn, and triumph in the end. This is why Hollywood and large publishing companies are just so darn powerful. They have survived for so long and have become rich and fat. However, Rome did fall in the end, and the establishment entertainment industry is teetering on its own precipice of ruin. When the Roman Empire was, at, was in its final days, the people of the empire didn't realize just how precarious their situation really was. In fact, they had just defeated Attila the Hun. It looked as if the empire was safe and secure, and then the Germanic tribes swept the empire and tore it apart in a series of grueling conflicts. The fall of Rome was brutal, long, and bloody, with all kinds of amazing victories and defeats wrapped up together in a confusing mess until the coup de grace was delivered and Rome itself, the great capital, fell and the Western Empire was plundered for scraps, while the eastern half of the empire, Byzantium, continued to stand. Go figure. I bring up this history because I find it very instrumental in understanding what is going on right now. The establishment entertainment industry has suffered from great defeats, but the war is changing. Ghostbusters 2016 and The Last Jedi were gigantic turning points when large film franchises began losing their audiences and creating their own enemies. Leaders in Hollywood creatives actually gloated that they now had visible enemies that they could bully and butcher, but the fans coalesced and fought back while others just lost interest and have left altogether. And though entertainment generated so many billions in revenue, the cracks had formed. Blood was in the water. Since then, the MCU has been in perpetual decline after Endgame. DC is a laughingstock, anime has trounced Western animation, and completely dominated nerddom. Hollywood is suffering many losses because of the streaming wars robbing companies like Disney of crucial millions of dollars in extra revenue. Fans have been disrespected so much that this has led to just general apathy. Cultural commentators are on the rise, transforming the digital landscape and bringing the war of, on modern myth now into people's homes from all kinds of directions. And there's been a growing number of combatants on all sides, all fighting for their own various reasons. So just like ancient Rome, the establishment industry is besieged from all sides with all these different factions all fighting for what they want and not for any one specific goal. There will be yet many more years of fighting, victories, and defeats, and the factions are, as I said, increasing in number. So with self-publishing, YouTube, TikTok, and many other forms of social media now in play, the opportunities to create and share your own stories are increasing, undermining the establishment's stranglehold. And with each major book and movie flop, shockwaves are running throughout the industry. Again, there is far more to say than I can ever cover here in one video, but this is the critical time to determine the future of storytelling and entertainment, which brings me at last to what we can do to solve this war and hopefully bring it to an end. <laughs> Brothers! What we do in life? 
Echoes in eternity. Imagine where you will be. And it will be so. Hold the line. Stay with me. If you find yourself alone, riding in green fields with the sun on your face, do not be troubled. For you are in Elysium. And you're already dead. The first thing is this. We need good storytellers. We need more good stories. You need your stories, and your stories need you, and the world needs your stories. That is my motto, and I'm sticking to it. The more we create and the more we share, the more potential goodness and inspiration we can put out into the world. And believe me, it really makes a huge difference to countless people you don't know and haven't even met yet. The masses crave good stories because storytelling is so essential to who we are as humans. It's how we communicate and identify. So if you are a creator, Keep working hard to improve and complete your projects. I have faith in you. I know you can do it. And if you need any help, that's what we are here for. And if you don't trust strangers on the internet that much, reach out to your friends, families, and others within your personal life and sphere. You will find the people that you need to help motivate and challenge you to become and do your best. Please check out our many other videos and podcast episodes to learn from our collective experiences and wisdom to help you become a better storyteller. But what if you're not a storyteller? What if you're not a creator? What if you have no aspirations to become such? What if you're just a fan and you're looking for good entertainment and you clicked on here because you wanted to know what this guy's got to say about the war on modern myth? Well, here are some things to consider, some of which you'll like and other stuff I know you won't. First of all, we have to respect the fact that all stories deserve to be told. Even stories you don't like. And as much as I don't like modern films and shows like Rise of Skywalker and The Rings of Power and Terminator Dark Fate and so forth, these stories deserved a chance to be told. Let them stand or fall on their own merit. And if you don't like them, then don't waste your time or money on them. Support what you do like by giving those stories and their creators your time, money, praise, and spreading the word about what you like. Next, be respectful. Just because the establishment wants to wrestle with you in the mud, you don't have to act like an uncultured swine. Sure, go ahead and be passionate. I know I like to get passionate here on some of these videos, but you can still express yourself without becoming toxic. Another thing to consider is this. This is a war of myth. And remember that the Hercules myth and how everyone wanted a piece of it and how they could decide what they wanted. Remember how I brought that up at the beginning of the video? We can do the same. The Harem recently had a conversation about Avatar The Last Airbender. We love the original series, but none of us could stand Legend of Korra. We acknowledge that it exists and its animation is wonderful, but we personally don't count it as canon. Yeah, the wiki pages might say differently, but so do we. The Star Wars sequel trilogy, that's fanfic nonsense to me, just like The Rings of Power. And I, while I enjoy The Mandalorian, and I'll count it as canon for right now, well, that kind of deterrent that's determined based on how entertaining and good the story remains. It's possible to have this strange outlook that you can determine for yourself what's canon and not, and still be respectful towards those who do enjoy those stories. Again, respect, don't be toxic. And on a similar note, stop letting bad reboots and sequels tarnish your enjoyment for the modern myths that you love. I get ticked off when I hear people say that they can't enjoy Star Wars because of Rey Skywalker. I'm sorry, but I can't see how you can be a dedicated fan to something you profess to love if you get angry at a story that you can easily dismiss. If there's a show or a movie that counters the myth that you love, you know what, what you can do is you can explain to people why you don't like it and then move on with your life. Completely discount it. Never go back to it. Instead, spend your time with the stories that you do love. You don't need to let uh, the original Star Trek series or the next generation be tarnished by the newest Star Trek drivel. No, you don't need to let that happen at all. Just don't watch it. Ignore it. Let other people rant and rave about it and enjoy what you enjoy. And remember this, myth is malleable, and you are empowered to dismiss what stories you don't like. This outlook 
changes the landscape of the war on modern myth because now it comes down to each story's own merit whether it will survive or not remember it is the stories that we love and continue to share from generation to generation that survive that matter that ultimately become myth so if you think indiana jones and the dial of destiny will wreck indiana jones for good don't watch it or you can pick your own ending point for indians and his adventures or you can write your own fan fiction to give him the ending that you want yeah, fan fiction is a great weapon in this war that all sides can wield. The thing is, you have the power. You can create your own stories. You can choose which stories to enjoy and pass along. You are the one with the purchasing power both in cash and time. That power is what makes the people who ridicule you fear you. While corporations and ideologues war amongst themselves to become top dog and determine the culture of our world through myth, they cannot control their audiences. This is the inherent failure of Marxism and neoliberalism. No one since Marx and Engels put forth their utopian theory has figured out how to control the hearts and minds of the people. Attacking myth is a great way to attempt that, but by its very nature they cannot wholly control our modern myths. So, as the establishment entertainment industry buckles under its adopted neoliberal ideology and the crushing financial weight of abusing their audiences and losing their footing as they don't give uh, time and attention to new creators and allow them to pump new life into the industry and the boulder of their own hubris and neglect weighs down on them, the time is ripe for change. Support the stories you enjoy. Encourage new creators. And to my fellow novice writers out there, keep on working and get your stories out there. Flood the world with good stories. Everyone needs them, and the industry is changing. While I don't know what it will look like by the year 2030, I do know that if we are all engaged in promoting what we love, passing on modern myths we enjoy, and taking inspiration to create new and well-written stories, the market will be inundated with a new stock of tales that will go on to inspire future generations and form future myths. We'll see what the future in reality holds for all of us, but I am actually filled with hope. While the war for modern myth is stepping into its most confusing and volatile stage yet, it opens up all kinds of opportunities for new factions and new creators. And all we have to do is seize those opportunities that are given to us. I may never become a pillar of fantasy writing like J.R.R. Tolkien or like some of my other uh, writing superheroes, but I will continue creating my own stories and getting better and bolder with each one. If you're looking for something new and fun to read, check out my books. Sandwich Desperados, Knights of Hallycruz, The Dark Rebellion, Bleed, Stim, and Steel, and Tumble Teller, the one I introduced at the beginning of this video. I'll do my part to bring great stories to the rest of the world, and you can do your part to promote the stories you love, and we will let our efforts decide who wins this war on modern myth. I can see this conflict ending in many different ways, but again, I have hope that we will return to great storytelling and that inspiring stories will once again reign supreme and inspire many generations yet to come. And with all that being said, this video has waxed eloquent and ranty and long enough. So, until the next video, y'all, keep up the good fight. Thank you for watching. Thank you for supporting us here at Camille's Harem. You guys are awesome. And, choose.